Thank you, Alia, and welcome everyone. And a special welcome, of course, to our um, speaker today, Kwesi Konadu. Uh, I wish this was in person. Um, we had originally, I think, scheduled Kwesi to present um, last year, and then, of course, we couldn't do so because of COVID, but um, he graciously agreed to present virtually, and we, we thank you very much for joining us today. Um, Kwesi Konadu is the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Endowed Chair and Professor at Colgate University in Hamilton, New York where I looked up um, just before we came on today, it's currently a blissful 24 degrees. Um, I think those of us in Madison right now are longing for the days when we'll see 20 degrees as we experience about zero, I think, right now. Um, his writings and his teaching focus largely on Africa and African diasporic histories. Um, and he's definitely one of those people who leave us wondering how one might have the time to accomplish so much when you look at his, um, his CV. He is the single author of four books and the co-author or editor of, editor of several more. Um, he's published many book chapters and articles in some of the major journals in the field. He's also a healer who studied with his grandfather in Jamaica and then in Tachiman in central Ghana. And finally, he's also a publisher of scholarly books about African world histories and cultures through the diasporic African press. Um, if you'd like to learn more about um, Kwesi and his work, you can visit his personal website at um, kwesikunadu.info. I will post that in the chat. I, I really encourage you to do so. It's a really beautifully laid out website, and I encourage you to, to visit it to learn more about uh, Kwesi Kunadu and his work. Um, today, he's going to talk to us about his most recent book, Our Own Way in This Part of the World, Biography of an African Community, Culture, and Nation, which was published by Duke University Press in 2019. Um, the book was the winner of the 2009 Sterling Stuckey Book Prize from the Association for the Study of the Worldwide African Diaspora. And with that, I will turn it over to Kwesi, and I look forward to your talk and the Q&A afterwards. Thank you very much, Neil, and uh, Aaliyah, as well as Diana for uh, the warm welcome on, on what would otherwise be a very cold day. Uh, appreciate it very much. All right, so I'll get started. So welcome everyone um, to this webinar. Again, I want to thank Neil, uh, Leah, and Diana for, again, the graces and warm welcome. So over the next half an hour, what I want to do is uh, I won't talk about the book, and some of you might have actually read um, part of all of it. What I do want to do, uh, therefore, is, is to sort of lay out some of the methodological as well as what I think of some of the key um, arguments and takeaways um, from the book. And hopefully by the end, I'll be able to persuade you uh, or otherwise convince you to um, get a copy if you haven't done so already. And so the um, figure you see drumming in, in front of you um, is uh, a was Nanakopi Donko. And Nanakopi Donko was uh, a multiverse, uh, a healer, a blacksmith, uh, as you can see in front of you, a drummer, a family head, a father, a husband, as well as a um, builder and planner uh, in his community, a settler of disputes, um, a marriage counselor, uh, and many more. And so I refer to this healer and the figure of the healer in African and world history as uh, a crucial window into an evolving culture and community. In other words, healers, um, perhaps more than other individuals, particularly but not solely within African contexts, African community contexts, they provide what I call wide angle lenses because of the multiple roles that they play, um, the multiple layers for which they give us a window or insight into. Um, and I, so I refer to he and others like him as multiverses, um, as these uh, individuals that give us, um, you know, multi-pronged approach to uh, culture, community, and in his case, um, a tripartite colony that then morphed into the nation or Republic of Ghana in March 1957. Kofi Donko was also a cocoa farmer, and so his um, life in many ways dovetails the struggles and ebbs and flow of many um, peasant farmers in early to late 20th century Ghana when Ghana was a major producer of cocoa. In fact, at one point before it was eclipsed by its neighbor, Cote d'Ivoire or Ivory Coast, Ghana was the world um, a leader, a world leader in cocoa production. In fact, cocoa was perhaps um, on its own, uh, what the commodity, the cash crop commodity that buoyed the tripartite colony. The book 
therefore tells a story of Kofi Donko, his family, his community in the uh, region referred to as Techimayan. Techimayan is geographically located. And in a moment, I share with you a few maps to spatially situate um, that place. But Techimayan is located about six hours northwest of Accra, the capital, two hours northwest of Kumasi, the capital of Asante Mine or the Asante region. And this particular location is really crucial for the one of the arguments that I make, which is oftentimes the standard accounts both in Ghanaian history and writ large African history usually takes the perspective of those folks on the coastline. That is those folks who uh, had um, various uh, kinds of interaction exchanges with um, Western, primarily Western Europeans on the coastline, at least for the last five or six centuries. And so what I wanna do here in this book uh, and, and with Kofi Donko and his community is to um, move the goalpost as it were, is to move our frame of reference, not from, not, you know, located in the coast, but to move it into the interior, that is to move it into uh, the interior part of Africa, where I'm less interested, though I understand the interactions between Africans and Europeans, I'm also interested in what I call these intra-African history, that is, histories that are being made uh, and fashioned among primarily and principally African actors, uh, precisely because one of the implications of the book is that um, much of the last five century uh, of, of Africa's uh, broad history in Ghana, no less, has really been shaped more so largely by these intra-African history that I'm referring to rather than exchanges with European folk on the coast. In other words, the Atlantic, as it were, was peripheral to most Africans. In fact, the largest towns and cities were always in the hinterlands, were always in the interior, which means that the force of gravity, that is the anchor of these communities, were in the interior. And so that's where I want to start rather than on the coast. And in doing so, you know, there, there are implications, you know, for it. The title of the book um, that rides this implication comes from an interview that was conducted with Kofi Donko um, in 1980, 1981, by then PhD student and now scholar in his own right, Ray Silverman, University of Michigan. And Kofi Donko said this uh, at the beginning of a libation, a libation text uh, in reference to Silverman and his interpreter. He said, for those in search of past events or matters connected to or with our culture, um, let them also let them know how how clearly we go about uh, things in our own way in this part of the world. And so the book is entitled Our Own Way in This Part of the World because it takes its ideational and conceptual sort of theoretical starting point from this statement of Kofi Donko. That is, according to Kofi Donko and the world in which he and large percentage of the populace lived, they had their own way of doing things in their part of the world. And, and this was not only a theoretical position, it was also an uh, invitation you know, to dig into what I'm referring to as these intra-African histories. And in starting not from the coast, one of the purchase or one of the, um, I think, valuable takeaways from this project is that if you look to the map on you know, um, your left, or actually my left, your right, which would be um, the um, Tichiman, which is located here where my cursor is moving, um, Techima is, is, is located between Wenchi and Nkranza, and of course, Kintampa to the north and Kumasi to the south. And so this is the, this is the homeland of Kofi Donko. And Kofi Donko's homeland is marked by one of the earliest um, formations of Akan speaking communities. And by Akan, I want to be absolutely clear because some people have tried to uh, disingenuously, um, you know, misinterpret you know uh, my arguments regarding them so a Khan comes from the root term kind which means first foremost pioneer and so a kind people that is the noun uh, refers to first nations pioneer peoples um, is a composite people so a kind is not an ethnic term or identifier it is essentially an argument a claim made to land and a claim made to being indigenous or autochana status and so 
think of them as the First Nations uh, that we have here in the United States and Canada. And so these Akain peoples um, take their, their root, their historical roots from in and around the Techiman area. And so we can see Techiman as not only a cradle, if not the cradle of Akan civilizations, it's also a dispersal zone because it's located roughly at the edge of the forest at eight degree latitude north and between the savanna, that is the grassland savanna to the north and the deciduous dense tropical forest to the south. And so being in Techimon afforded people like Hope Yudonko in this community access to the resources both in the forest and in savanna. Techimon therefore was also a crossroads town between the two ecologies, between what is now Northern and Southern Ghana, between the Northern more Islamicized portions of Ghana and the more Christianized portion in the South. And being in this, this particular positionality, Kofi Donko offers again, another layer to thinking about these intra-African histories from that particular standpoint. To the right, you see the contemporary boundaries of Ghana and there's a dotted overlay of the Asante Empire, its extent, uh, particularly in the 19th century, if not by the late 18th century. And so notice that the extent, that is the frontiers of the Asante Empire was much larger than the current borders of contemporary Ghana. And this is significant because the um, tripartite colony that will develop is essentially Asante Mai or the Asante Empire. So in, in effect, the British did not create the colonies. They simply neutralized and therefore turn Asante Mine against itself. That is the very structure of Asante Empire. Once Asante capitulated in around 1900, 1901, then the geography of the Asante Empire was simply put to use for British ends. And this is important because we often think of British colonialism, but actually there are layers to this story. And so for instance, Kofi Donko, um, he's born in Kranza, which is there on the map in the center, you see. And then he moves to his mother's hometown very young to Techiman, and he spends most of his life, in fact, the rest of his human life in Techiman. But Techiman, like in Kuranza, was under Asante hegemony. And Asante was under British colonial rule after 1900, 1901. And so Kofi Donko lived within a dual colonialism, a dual hegemony, that is Asante hegemony, that is a local African empire, and the British empire, as the um, sort of second or third layer to his existence. And so he again offers us a very integral perspective on, again, the nature of the um, various localities that are under these layers of hegemony and colonial rule rather than one single colonialism that we get offered in standard accounts. And if that was the you know, sort of broad shot, I want to sort of peer it down into the particular region where Kofi Donko's life is transacted and where all the thousands of patients, the hundreds of healers which he trained and the numerous scholars that fed on his particular intellectual knowledge and acumen. And so this is the tripartite colony because often in the standard accounts of the history of the Gold Coast Ghana, what we get are simply go colonial Gold Coast, that is one sort of metastasized blob. But in fact, there were three colonies that were bundled into one, uh, or three colonies that essentially were resourced, viewed, and appropriated distinctively. And so the Gold Coast colony is a southern portion that you see here where my cursor is, is, is moving uh, in. And, and that was the first area in which the first step in um, British colonial rule. It was actually seizing and through force and agreements or, or alliances and treaties with the southern tier of that region. And then it was not going to the center where Santi um, still was dominant. It was going to the northern territories and using a mixture of fraud, um, treaties and other um, related tactics to essentially uh, get those you know, polities and communities in the Northern territories as they were to essentially concede their land and sovereignty to the British under the guise of treaties of friendship in, in, in quotations. And then by cutting off the legs and, and sort of the head of Asante, the body was left and that was seized upon um, in 1900, 1901 during the infamous or famous Ya Asantua war of that period. And so once Asante became a crown colony, 
it joined the other three colonies. And, and again, these three colonies were resourced uh, and viewed or perceived through the machinations of the British imperialists quite differently. In fact, they viewed the Northern Territories as, as essentially backwards, um, barbaric, nothing civilized uh, could exist there. The view of Sante still uh, with suspicion, but with awe, because this was still, you know, in, in many ways, a defeated empire, but it's still an empire of sorts. And so there was that mixture of respect and awe that they were sort of half civilized peoples. And then the coast was supposed to be the bastion of Christian orthodoxy, capitalism, and of course, um, latent forms of empire. And so these were the three colonies, again, that disrupt the standards account that we get of the Gold Coast Ghana. And to look further, as we take a bird's eye view of the locality of Tichiman, where again, Kofi Donko and his um, communities um, lived or lived out their lives, what we find is that we can actually historicize many of the key spiritual forces that are referred to in Chi as Abusun. That is, it takes this ideational root from the Chi verb Sumbu, uh, which means to serve something of a limited purpose. And so the Abusum are these spiritual forces that have been uh, wrongheadedly uh, characterized as, as, as fetish or as, as cults, but neither of those really capture what these mean among the indigenous, among the uh, local peoples. And so these dots here represent not only these early settlements that map out the world of Kobidonko, but they map out the um, ancient peoples, the Bono peoples of that region. And by the way, Bono uh, re refers to the idea or the sense of um, to be created first. And so it is also a claim like a kind of being pioneers of being indigenous of being autochons. And these Bono people trace their histories to the fifth century archeologically dated to a cave around Pinahi. And then they moved to Yefri, which means we came from, and then they moved to Kranka, then Tanabwasi, then Tribudom, and then Techiman, and so on and so forth. This arc of a migratory and ancestral plane um, were settlements that were built around these major uh, Abusum. And so the, the most significant of which is, let me back up a moment. The most significant of which was um, Tano, that is both the river, that is, that is the embodiment of the Abusum Takura or Tanokura. And Tano is one of the most important spiritual forces in Akan life throughout the entire region uh, of Ghana and beyond. And so these finding these spiritual forces by hunters and usually their sisters uh, establishes these villages. And so um, the historicity of these spiritual forces are laid out in the, in, in the order in which settlements appear. And so Tanobwasi appears first, then Tribudom, then Techiman, then Tanoso. And of course, Tanoso means on the river, River Tano, that is. And so in many ways, um, what the book does historicize these spiritual forces, but also it, it maps out the particular demography and peopling of this cradle of a civilization. And of course, many of the people in Ghana, um, that people, what became Ghana, they had traced their roots to the Techiman region. So the Fante people, for instance, claim that they came through Techiman in a much earlier period. The people that came to inhabit Denshura, the people that came to inhabit Achim Busume and others, they claim also to come from this region. So this is not only a, a crossroads area, a dispersal zone. It's also, again, this very fertile cradle for a con civilization. And let's see here. This is the township of Kofi Donko where, where he lived. And I'm going to begin to move a little quicker um, in the interest of time. But this is a bird's eye view of the township, the Techiman township. And there are major roads. So this is literally metaphorically a crossroads town, but there are major roads. Um, you see the road to your left, that is um, to the west, going to Kumasi. Uh, there's a road going to Inkranza, there's a road going to Sunyani, and there's a road going to Tamale. And so these were the cardinal points that, that essentially um, cut through the township of Techiman. And Kofi Donko and his family lived within the Tunsunasi um, ward. Um, Tunsunasi is a reference to the blacksmith. And so Kofi Donko was a blacksmith. He was trained by his uncle, also a blacksmith. 
uh, his father uh, was an herbalist as well. And so medicine and blacksmithing uh, ran within the family. In fact, Kopidonko's sisters were both healers as well, including their mother was also a healer. And so healing, medicine, and blacksmithing uh, ran through the um, family body, but also the public body, this community. But in this town, what is crucial to remember is that um, there were particular skilled areas or wars where particular families live. And so um, the Hemphie ward were those of the sort of ruling family that traced their descent, traced their lineage, excuse me, to the founding custodians of the land. And then you have the uh, Abainim, and this is where the most important town of Abusum in Techiman um, is, is based, which is referred to as Ta Mensa or Tano Mensa, which is third born. And so this architecture, this social layout, you know, is replicated in many Akan communities. And on the periphery, we find these Hausa and Dagumba war. These are non-Akan peoples. And so they usually live in the what are called strangers quarters or Zungo from Hausa uh, in Zungo. Uh, referring to these strangers quarters, people that are non akan that are that are integrated into the Akan social political order, but are still um, peripheral by their own choice in terms of uh, the prescriptions of Islam that run through their ideologies. And so as we move from tripartite colony to region and to township, um, these scales give us a sense of the lived experiences of Kofi Donko and the peoples within his community. And Kofi Donko uh, was part of a class like this of healers. This is a um, photo, early photo. Uh, and Kofi Donko's sister, Nana Ajwa Kumsa, is actually in this photo on the bottom screen to your right. And um, this was a, a, a normal reoccurring, that is the training of healers, the training of these multiverse personnel to serve the interests of the communities rather than their self-interest. And one of the key uh, features, the community features of these healers as captured here by Robert Rattray, the colonial anthropologist 1923, when he visited Techiman, um, is this festival called Apo. And the root term of Apo means to reject or to eject eject what you might wonder. It is a cleansing ritual to get out all the angst and anger and frustration that people may have, um, the common folks may have towards the leadership, all the criticism. So on this particular day or several days of a pole festival, um, the uh, people, the healers who are the spiritualists and therefore custodians, spiritual custodians of the land and the immature resources, they feature prominently because they are, the, they are the, essentially the cohesive glue uh, between the immaterial and material forces uh, of the land. And Techimon has a particular order whereby the political leadership is subservience to the head of the healers. Very few Akan communities still have that, but in early time they did. And so again, spiritual leadership is actually um, higher than political indigenous authority. And this festival is, is essentially puts all of that on display. This contract between political custodian of land and the spiritual custodian of land is put on display in a poll festival. It's also a time once more where you give people a chance where the rules in society flattens and healers like Kobe Donko was instrumental in getting people essentially to do what uh, contemporarily truth and reconciliation commissions try to do within various African and non-African contexts, which is try to get people to to get out their angst and frustration in a, in a positive, productive way without essentially allowing that to fester and, and bleed into destructive ways. And this occurs every March or April or so uh, in the region. Kofi Donku was also intellect. And so um, you see here in the, in the, in the, in, in the middle, uh, a colleague of ours, his name is Awusu Bren Pong and uh, a well-known ethnomusicologist, but he was then a um, graduate, um, undergraduate student. And he worked with Dennis Warren, which is to the right, one of three anthropologists that would have some interaction with Kofi Donko over his life. And Dennis Warren um, in this particular photo sets up a template for knowledge production in African studies and African um, um, 
history in the 1960s uh, and 70s and beyond. In other words, the idea that knowledge is to be brokered through African informants and interpreters, and then the white scholars would then take that knowledge to the marketplace for their dissertations, for their articles, and for their books, where they receive tenure, promotion, and acclamation, whereas the people who are the experts of and, and, and the you know, providers and supplies of that knowledge uh, have a different material uh, and intellectual uh, outcome. So the irony is that during the period of independence for Ghana, um, where you know independence was supposed to ring and resound widely, what happens is that African studies was also coming of age during this period of African nations coming of in, you know independence and therefore of age in terms of becoming nation states. But the irony of, of all this euphoria was, was that much of the knowledge industries, for instance, was far from independent, was far from autonomous, was still driven by these colonial models of knowledge production. And of course, that bled into the inequities between global inequities between Africa and the world, which we can talk about more later. Let me get back here. So Kofi Donko also um, was a family figure and head. This is his wife and main collaborator, uh, Afia Bunafie. Uh, Kofi Donko would have several wives, but there are circumstances that essentially um, are tied to those. And we can talk about that, uh, which the book does in detail. Um, but she is the main collaborator, the main person that uh, works, um, they work together in partnership, both in healing. Uh, in fact, a number of their children become healers themselves, which is of course not surprising. Um, but the two of them actually begin to work out a plan um, for um, their family and for their community. And so in marriage, you know, Kofi Donko begins to take on this, this, this role um, of not only father and husband, but he begins to, in many ways, become sort of an intellectual father for the wider community. Okay. And I apologize for interrupting you, but I just wanted to let you know that we cannot see the full picture. So if you want to end screen sharing and start over again, that might help. Hmm. Okay, uh, all right, so. Okay, so I'll start again. <laughs> from the beginning or from where I left off? From where you left off, thank okay. you. Okay, all right. Can you see now? Yes. Okay, you. great, great. Okay, well, folks, thank you for your patience and forbearance with the technologies. <laughs> so uh, if you follow the, the general storyline so far, so we left off where uh, Kofi Donko's um, and Fia Funafie, they essentially in marriage, you know, form this partnership uh, for both family community and for their, their particular role in pushing forward the, this healing uh, vocation of theirs, producing themselves, uh, children who become healers, but also um, who begin to see Kofi Donko take on these outsized role, again, these multifarious roles uh, within his life. And part of that, you know, outsized role was training not only healers, as you see here, that are local to Ghana. So um, to the right is an Okumfo or, or, or spiritualist healer from Kumasi, from the Asante region being trained. Uh, and then the person who's here is, 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 is being um, cut doing the ritual call, Kunkuma, uh, is Nana Kweku Sechi, who was originally comes from Trinidad in the Caribbean. He now lives in Miami. And so he's one of the first, but not only uh, diasporic Africans that were trained by Kofi Donko, which was in fact rare among the cadre of healers in the community. So Kofi Donko is not only local and regional, uh, he's transnational because his healing ideas and, and training and, and knowledge spreads to Europe, to the Americas and other parts of the world, even though he never left Ghana himself. And in concert with that outspanded, you know, uh, expanding outward role in terms of knowledge, healing and training, um, Kofi Donko um, served all in his community, in, in, you know, regardless of their, um, you know, political affiliation, religious orientation, or uh, other kinds of markers of human difference. And so he was um, beloved in many ways uh, would seek, uh, they would seek out his, his services among the Islamic or Mo African Muslim community for whom you see representatives here on the left. On the right, this is the Methodist church in, in Techiman 
um, many of the people, uh, by my count, given a few record books with Kofi Don't Go Left Behind, um, he also served uh, at least half of, of, of the thousands of people that came to see him um, during any given year um, were people who adhere to one iteration or the other of the Judaic Christian um, theology. And so his, his approach to African life and living was to serve people regardless of their political and religious or other affiliation and, and orientation. And therefore he provides, I think, a very important, um, you know, foundational, you know, um, anchor for um, human flourishing in African societies. And Kofi Donko was also one of the first to um, become part and even support um, these um, programs. Here you see members of what was called the Prepe program, that is the um, program for um, trading indigenous or traditional healers, as they were called. Uh, and the idea was to integrate both the best uh, of the worlds of indigenous medicine with so-called bio you know, medicine or allopathic medicine. And this is one of those training sessions where, where healers um, were a part. And Kobe Donko, of course, sanctioned this. He, he was about um, standing on his own cultural acumen and platform, but still um, open to services that would aid and support the values of his community. And here, health was one of those. So he would partner with the Holy Family Hospital, the most important and singular, uh, well, not singular now, but then the singular hospital. Now they're about three in Tachiman. Um, but in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, there were only the, the Holy Family Hospital that serviced um, tens of thousands of people. And so the family not only partnered, I mean, the hospital, excuse me, not only partnered with them, but the hospital would send patients that they had to Kofi Donko. That's how much respect and, um, you know, he had garnered, you know, in terms of the efficacy of his healing and approach to medicine. And Kofi Donko, of course, regularly um, served his community. In fact, from those record books, he healed over 60 years because he trained very early as a teenager. And so um, by the time he passed, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, as the book lays out in further detail, were healed. And here you see just a few snippets uh, of that care and, and, and health, that is delivering health with care um, to community people. So he's healing the broken foot, you know, by creating a cast for this young child, whereas he's checking on the pregnant mother um, to the right. So not only dealing with the, the, the newborn, but also dealing with life that is forthcoming. And Kofi Donko, in wrapping, you know, my talk up, um, he provides, you know, a very crucial, you know, counterpoint, I want to say alternative, but counterpoint to uh, how we think about colonialism in African societies, Ghana no less. And so he allows us to see colonial rule as no, not, not only an inquisition, where African cultures, cultural forms and norms were on trial, um, but more so as what I'm referring to as forced intimacy, that is, that is the idea of, of propinquity, um, the state of, of being close in proximity, that the, the colonial apparatus was a forced intimacy, that is, it laid bare or forced to lay bare, um, you know, intimate and sacred ecologies, spiritual forces, lifeways, homes, um, and even psyches. And that particular um, um, imposed coercion uh, and physical power and essentially pro close proximity without being invited to, it created a certain kind of closeness, which I think is one way to explain that even though the Goko is gonna only experience a formal colonialism uh, for two generations or 60 years, um, those years, because of the close proximity of the false intimacy I'm arguing, it led to some very, um, you know, not permanent, but, but certainly uh, longer lasting effects, even though the tenure of former colonial rule, if we use the European script of colonialism as, as, as the guide. Um, and so there has to be a way to explain that. That is why the fanatic and frenetic spread of Pentecostalism uh, among people who um, decades before the 60s uh, had pushed back for centuries, in fact, against Christian orthodoxy, had pushed back against Islamic orthodoxy, where in Kumasi, the capital, again, of the Asante Empire, you had no more than 5% of the population who were Muslim. And so there, there was a certain way in which people had engaged the, these um, imported you know, ideologies, imported theologies, 
but that that seemed to that wall you know seemed to dissipate that immune system seemed to become compromised and, and i'm arguing that the way to explain that is through forced intimacy is through this notion of propinquity that is the straightness or closeness and proximity um, led to certain effect where certain bonds are formed um, by this forced intimacy by this encounter and where um, major public intellectuals like Kwesi uh, have argued recently um, and, and others in, in well in, in the press uh, about Ghana's um, colonial mentality because Ghana was touted as the model colony of the British and there's a reason for that which we can get into a little bit later and so um, in closing therefore um, this is a picture of the um, cadre for for the independence uh, independent Ghana, the political apparatus led by Kwame Nkrumah and others. And what I'm arguing is that these people were less than equipped um, to um, decolonize because I argue in the book that decolonization as a process um, is a political project, but that project leads to several outcomes of which the nation is only one, the nation is only one. And the fact that Kwame Nkrumah and others chose the nation as, as, as the you know, principal outcome of decolonization, decolonization could not occur and did not occur. Um, and as such, Kwame Nkrumah and others relied on essentially um, the, the very um, riddled or, or crippled nation state model of the US that itself is um, plagued by a range of isms, uh, sexism, racism, classism. And that became the archetype of model whereby even decades after Ghana and Kwame Nkrumah is no longer with us, 1992, when Ghana becomes so-called uh, um, democracy, uh, it modeled its constitution off the U.S. Constitution, and so in many ways, this barred imagination, right, I, is, is is a function of what I'm arguing of this forced intimacy for which Kofi Donko had an alternate model, that is a decolonized community that was uh, that was that was that essentially transcended those isms, and provided a place for where everyone could belong but without compromising the profile and the resume of the people. Because at time of independence, the irony, deep irony, I think, is that while the, the populace had a resume of being A, farming, B, illiterate in European uh, languages, but you know, certainly literate in their, in their own uh, cultural knowledge and forms, uh, and C, non-Christian and non-Islamic. The overwhelming vast majority of the people, that was their profile. And so rather than essentially, you know, essentially grow out or build out from that resume, Kwame Nkrumah and others began to what? Force both the neo-colonial, um, you know, actually the, the nation state, and at that, a very faulty archetype of nation state, and at that, one uh, that essentially betrayed you know, the, the, the people. So in many ways, rather than show up indigenous cultures and identities, uh, he sought to undermine them, including so-called chieftaincy, you know, for his own political ends. And we can talk about all the ways in which, you know, that happened during the Q&A. So I'll leave you all uh, with uh, where I began uh, and Kobe Donko's uh, mantra that again, for those scholars and writers, you know, in search of past events uh, or matter connected with, um, you know, their culture, African cultures, um, they should take their, their cue from the notion that these um, peoples on the ground have their own way of doing things in their part of the world. And I thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that, um, that uh, stimulating and in some respect provocative talk. Um, so we're open now for questions and comments, discussion. Um, reminder, there are two ways you can um, ask a question or make a comment. You can type it in the Q&A box or you can raise your hand and I, um, I will call on you and encourage you to do that if you're willing. And so the floor is open. Well, Ponado, while we wait for questions to come in, would you mind showing us some of the earlier images just so people can see the full image? Sure, uh, I gladly do so. Ah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Let's see here. Okay, here we go. And I don't know why <laughs> this doesn't show up earlier. 
Uh, so this, this was the first image and I will put it on the slideshow. Yeah, so this was the first image, uh, Kobe Don't Code, um, uh, one, of his, one of his many talents uh, as a drummer. And uh, for those um, musicians or musicologists, this is the infamous Atumpan drum that has the same tonal patterns as the Akan tree language. And so people are able to communicate literally with and through these drums. I have a question here. If you're yes. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Lindsay Arisman, you should be able to speak. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi, thank you so much for this really, really wonderful talk. And um, I'm working my way through your book at the moment. So this has just been so nice to hear you talk about it as I'm reading. But in the book, one thing that really struck me that I'm just, I wanna hear more about is this um, methodological approach you have of a communography. And after hearing your talk and hearing about just the like expansiveness of this community where people are getting trained in Ghana and then going out into diasporic communities, how do you find the boundaries of that community? What, what is the scope and scale of that community and how do you write a biography about it? And how did you sort of arrive at this approach? That's a great question, Lindsay. Thank you for that. Um, and so the, the term biography in the, in the subtitle is actually a carrot that I, I say, so I'm not trying to be coy here. Um, I say that it's a carrot to bring people into using the familiar to the unfamiliar. And what I wanna bring them into is that very notion that you mentioned, Lindsay, of a communiography whereby I'm not interested in the particular life story of the individual. Rather, I am interested in how that life ricochets and, and, and rubs against all the hundreds and thousands of people in their lifetime to create what we might call a people's history from the ground up. But I also think of it as much more broadly, as you say. So I don't really see any bounds on it because I don't think it's my, it's my um, role as, as a historian to uh, adjudicate uh, what are the bounds of people's idea of community. What I'm fascinated by is, is the fact that it doesn't, it, it can be porous. In other words, the fact that Kofi Donko was so um, essentially adamant about being grounded and standing on his own cultural platform, but he wasn't dogmatic or, or arrogant in terms of his openness, you know, of that community, as long as those who he partnered with essentially um, fed or upheld the values of the community, right? And so again, he treated everyone um, in, in, in a climate, again, that was punctuated, I'm thinking of very well, by uh, all these um, military and economic transitions, right? Um, periods of drought and famine and IMF World Bank uh, of, of, of five or six military coups. And he and his community just keep plugging away, um, not to say that they're unaffected, but what I'm trying to poke at is that, is how the community essentially are moving through these times. Um, and they do so, I think, because of Kofi Donko. So Kofi Donko, for example, many of the people that came for his services came from what is now Togo, came from Benin, came from um, Ivory Coast, particularly Bonduku, uh, Sampa, and other parts as well. And some came from Northern Ghana and Burkina Faso. And so, the fact that his network of people, either as trainees, as, as, as patients, or as, as scholars who came to, again, to feed for the purpose of dissertation or other kinds of research, um, his network was transnational. His network was, was, was without borders. And, and mm -hmm. they were also part of his community because he welcomed them all, um, even though he was suspicious of a number of them in terms of their intention. And some of that is in the book, particularly the chapter um, that features um, Dennis Warren and, and uh, his particular role in that. So again, I think his, his, his notion of community was much more, I think, elastic, right? Much more mm -hmm. uh, to the tenor of the people because one of the, I think, one of the failures of African history, which I, I obviously I take, you know, wait for this, is tracking African movement, right? within Africa and outside of it. African history has done a poor job of that. And so what I'm trying to do is, is do some of that work, right? To say that um, tracking African movement, intra-African movement also within the continent, within the region, but also outside of them, right? Tracking these people, because these people belong to networks, transnational networks. And I think there is a lot of value in, in showing that. Thank you so much.
Uh, we have another question here from um, Heinz Klug. You should be able to speak now, Heinz. Sorry, I was <laughs> muted. Um, thank you very much for an absolutely fabulous presentation. And you've totally convinced me I've got to read your book. <laughs> I'm going to come out and go out and get it. Um, but I'm fascinated too between in this dichotomy that you um, have presented in a way between a African community that is uh, a broad and, and, and engages intra-Africa and, and beyond and the nation state mm -hmm. as uh, the, you know, the post-colonial nation state that in effect, that seems to restrict this community and, and reform it in a different or attempt to reform it in a different way. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about your thoughts of that interaction between mm -hmm. this broader community and the nation state. That's a great Post question. Post-colonial huh? African nation state. Yeah. Yes, that's, that's a great question, Heinz. Um, my quick thoughts um, to, I guess, get, get more folks uh, who are interested in qu asking questions or comments. A quick thought is, is that um, it's not so much a dichotomy, it's more of the imposition. So remember I said earlier that Kofi Donko and, and his community and others lived under dual hegemony, right? Sante Empire in one layer and then the top layer, think of it like a, like a triple layer cake, right? right? And the top layer or another layer, I should say, uh, what was, was sort of the British colonial uh, overlay. And so these are layers that I'm referring to. And so the nation say is simply what a truncated layer uh, through the architecture of Kwame Nkrumah and his regime um, from 57 to 66 when he was uh, ousted um, in a coup d'etat. And the two are not irreconcilable, but they are in the ways in which they came about. In other words, if the nation came about through sort of a plebiscite or sort of a you know grand you know series of town halls with the people, that would that would that would sort of out, be an outgrowth of what they have. So I'll give you one concrete example: the colonial cocoa board. Kwame Nkrumah didn't get rid of it. In fact, he kept it and reified it and, and made it draconian. Um, and however. There was a uh, indigenous form of, of organizing labor around cocoa and other resources that was called Intorba. And so uh, rather than use Intorba, which was used by the way, during the so-called colonial and post-colonial era, Kwame Nkrumah essentially sabotaged that because he couldn't control it as you could control the cocoa board. And so that led to the nepotism and, and, and the, and the um, banditry and crookedry for which writers like Ayikwe Amar writes about in The Beautiful Ones Not Yet Born, right? And so um, again, it, it, it's, it's the overlay and the mismatch between the overlay that, that, that I'm getting at rather than a dichotomy because you know, if the nation, whatever, whatever political community people think of, I'm suggesting that you know, the nation should be an outgrowth of who the people are, who, their resume and building on their forms and norms rather than providing a truncated vision which later became socialist and, and moved even further away from what the people were in terms of their own indigenous institutions and forms. That's fabulous. Thank you. That's really great. Thank you. Um, thank you. So while people are still gathering their thoughts and questions, I'm going to exercise my prerogative and ask a, ask a question on my own. It's kind of a follow-up to uh, Lindsay's first question about um, method and to your comments about the production of knowledge in African studies and in African history in particular. And um, you have this photograph up here, I think of Dennis Warren. Um, and you, as you mentioned earlier, he's uh, one of the central figures in one chapter of your book where you're talking about the production of knowledge um, in African studies. And so my question is, um, you seem very critical of folks like Warren for, for, for justified reasons, I think. Um, and so it's sort of a two part question. Um, can you sort of discuss a little bit what you would do in this case, how you would do this work better, um, both thinking like if you were in 1970 in this case, or today even, working with someone um, like Donko, right, Kofi Donko, what would you do differently from the way things were done then by largely outside white researchers like Dennis Warren? And then two, what is your relationship to the body of work and the archives produced by people like Warren? Because um, this photograph and many others of the many photographs in your, in your book are from his archive and you use some of the material from his archive. And so what, yeah, what is your relationship to the work produced by people that you are justifiably very critical of? Mm -hmm. Great two-part question. Um, 
if I, if I can, Neil, I'll combine them because I think that there's a lot of overlap between the two. So you're absolutely right. Um, there, there, is, um, there, there is this body of work um, that's produced, but as I argue, and I think I show in the book, that work, including the photos, is not Dennis Warren's work alone. In fact, Awusa Brim Pong, uh, in my interviews with him and, and the records that I've seen from his own archive and from Dennis Warren's archive, by the way, I went, to, I, I went through Dennis Warren's papers, both at Iowa State and University of Iowa, where he taught for decades before he passed. And so what the sort of, you know, looking at the various archives and, and, and by various, I mean, there are multiple indigenous archives, including language and tree language tech, which I use very, very much because again, what I'm interested in creating is the world that Kofi Donko would have moved through, right? And so um, in, in looking at the, the, these archives and looking at knowledge production, um, I am critical of, of Warren, yes, um, but I, I'm, I'm not, well, I hope I'm not, um, um, you know, one-sided, right? In a sense of um, he, his interest in, in, in dissertation particularly, which is about 600 pages, his dissertation was interested in, you know, trying to do some things that I'm trying to do. That is, he's trying to figure out these disease lexeme according to the Bono Akan language, right? And the concepts that the people use, right? Um, the challenge for him, rather than criticism, is, is that um, he is a part of a knowledge industry, which he doesn't defy, he falls into, that appropriates that knowledge, uh, benefits hands me from it, uh, and it's a one-way street, right? Um, so I'm simply pointing out, it's less a criticism, it's more like an empirical observation to say that the knowledge industry to which Warren and others are embedded in, um, you know, he doesn't push it back against that. You know, in fact, he benefits from this handsomely. He becomes a World Bank expert, right, based upon the work that, by the way, Awusa Brempong did 85% of the work. The interviews are by Awusa Brempong. Dennis Warren, according to his own notes, said that he was never able to conduct an interview by himself. He learned some of the language, but not proficiently enough. And so um, the maps were drawn by Wusa Brimpong. Uh, the interviews, the surveys that were done among 4,000 people in the community of Techiman were done by Wusa Brimpong. So even the claim when he singled off the article in his book at Dennis Warren, that's a false claim. So pointing that out, I don't think it's a criticism. I think it's simply just pointing out what, it, what was the case. Now, what would I do? Um, because in the, in the position I think you and I and others are in, if we work with graduate students in particular, right, is that A, um, you know, we need scholars, whoever they are, to start with the respect for the people they study by A, learning their language or major languages, B, spending more time than simply a year and a half of field work. I couldn't have written this book by, if, if I was a graduate student. This book took me at least a decade. And what I'm, I'm making an argument for the more seasoned, right? The, 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 le the less, less production, and this seems ironic coming from a person like me who've written a few books, but what I'm saying, it, it, it is the long tenure. Um, it, it, is, it is, you know, being in a place and with a people whereby um, you are able to, I think, um, be so seasoned, so, so grounded, then you have, the wherewithal, you know, not to reproduce the standard accounts that are <laughs> praised within African studies and African history, um, but I think they, they fall short of the the sort of texture and tenure of the people that they describe. Thank you. It's one o'clock and we're, I think uh, um, uh, we're glad to stay for um, a few more minutes if people want. Um, I have another question that I, I encourage other people also to ask. I'll ask my one more question while people are, are, are uh, coming up with theirs. So um, it sort of follows up, I guess, on Heinz's a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and in, I think you, you closed the talk by juxtaposing um, uh, Kofi Donko to other um, sort of other types of people in um, in independent Ghana, 
and sort of looking at their worldviews as quite different. And um, in the, the way in which you speak about Kofi Donko and his work and his life and his vision for the world, I'm wondering if, if this is a bit romanticized. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, one of the things we've learned over the last you know, bunch of years, couple decades in studies of health and healing in, in African contexts is that um, healers and, and healing has the capacity to do harm as well as to, as to provide curative services, right? Mm -hmm. um, and part of that depends on the healer, part of it depends on the context and, what, and, and the practice itself. Um, but, but, and when you start talking about the isms of the United States, right? Um, and, and by extension of perhaps of independent Ghana, and as opposed to the capacious worldview that Kofi Donko had, is this a bit romanticized? Did you run into people who criticized him, um, whether either in speaking to them or in the archives or elsewhere? Um, the short answer is no. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm aware that, that that charge might be made because I, I've seen the charge before. <laughs> um, the, the the charge, of course, it, it's 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 what it is. Um, but I don't think it's romanticized uh, if that's the charge, um, because um, I think that there, there, there's a way in which African studies scholarship, um, you know, looks at at Africa and Africans uh, as as from the starting point of, of problems. And so NGOs, um, you know, state their claim on the premise of problems. Um, PhD students, you know, um, go to uh, investigate and do field work on the premise of a problem. And for me, um, I take a different starting point. Uh, my starting point is, and I, know, I, I mentioned this in the introduction to the book where I am upfront. So um, I don't claim to be romantic or objective or, or, or any of those things. I claim to, to try to get the story right. But I also made the claim that there are other ways to tell this story. And I say very clearly that if Kofi Donko were alive and willing to write this book, he would probably write a different account. Which is to say that I'm not attached to any particular view because my goal is to get the story right as best as I can with the sources that I have. Um, and so um, everything that I've learned about Kofi Donko, um, including his, in, in some of his, in his missteps, um, seem to me very human, but but they seem um, to me very genuine. I mean, I've not met a person, even I interviewed um, one of his living um, former wives. And yes, yeah, he talked about the circumstances of their marriage, uh, which of course are detailed in the book, but there was nothing negative about him, right? And guess what? I wasn't going there for gossip and expose. I just asked open-ended questions and no one, in fact, during my years in Tetsuma, by the way, I never met Kofi Donko. He passed away before I met him. And so um, I was undergrad. I think I mentioned that in the introduction when he passed away. And so I did not meet him on, therefore, know him in the flesh. But I remember, you know, in my years in, in traveling and spending time in, in Tetsuma, that I met people who were still coming to see him year, decades after he passed. I'm saying this person, which is not, not unusual, by the way, um, these unassuming, um, you know, community-based people uh, with a certain humanistic value, um, you know, th there really wasn't anyone that I, 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 I that that said anything. And, and I've I've spoken to, uh, interviewed, and and gone through many archives in the UK, um, in West Africa, uh, in the Americas. I mean, my, my bibliography I think shows you. Uh, even organizations like the Salvation Army that worked in Tetsuma. If anyone that had a footprint in that community, I would try to find their records. And that's why it took me so long. And that's why I'm making the argument for perhaps reconsidering how we do graduate school. Yeah. Um, so what I'm saying is, is that there's nothing that I found that would suggest that there was anything disingenuous uh, in the accounting. But I opened the possibility that if he and others would look at the same evidence, um, they might write a different account. Thanks, that's it's fascinating. Um, I see we have a hand up here from Jacqueline Mugwe. Um, Jackie, you should now be able to talk. Hi, thank you for this really fascinating talk. And, and as I was listening to your talk, I couldn't help but think about uh, Richard Price's book, Travels with uh, Tui. And I'm really curious to know 
what your position was as a researcher while you were conducting the oral interviews. How did your background shape the narratives and the different contacts that you made? Thank you. Great question, Jacqueline. Thank you for asking. Uh, I have read that book <laughs> um, and, and, and like it. Unlike Richard Price, who takes a position that he's the anthropologist and therefore the expert and Toy isn't. He's just a so-called Obia man. I don't take that position. The position I took is that as a partnership that um, yes, you know, it's a single authored monograph um, given again, the knowledge industry that I'm a part <laughs> and that we are a part, but I took the role of partnership that, you know, I'm partnering with Kobe Doko, And that's why I said a moment ago to Neil's, um, you know, great question that if Kofi Donko were to write this book and I would read it, <laughs> um, there are other ways to do this, right? And I'm open to that, that mine is simply one interpretation of the same as evidence. And so I view this as a partnership and that's why I said in the introduction and I'll say it to you if you haven't checked out the book is that I want Kofi Donko to have been able to see himself in this book. If he can't see himself in the book, then I have failed. In other words, I want to partner with, you know, the people, not as informants, not as interpreters, which of course I really didn't use any, um, but I, I wanted to be able to, um, you know, put something on the table that the peoples, the thousands and hundreds of people, some of which I was fortunate to meet, um, could see themselves, you know, um, in th th this, this particular work, right? And so that was my, my sort of value-based, you know, uh, approach as a researcher. And again, I made no claims to be objective, uh, which I think is a farce, um, but I made my claim to trying to get it right. Um, but, I open, but I'm open to the possibility that uh, either in whole or in part, that's, you know, that's possible that I've gotten certain things um, incorrectly. Thank you. Sure thing. Any other questions or comments? Last chance here. Well, um, Kwesi, thank you so much for this talk and this great conversation. I personally look forward to continuing this talk with you. I have lots more questions actually, but we can, we can take this offline. <laughs> um, and we hope to hear from you soon again in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much.